This is Play by Playcast. Is that faster than a greyhound? The podcast about play by play guys. For play by play guys, I am told a play by play guy. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Now, here's the host of Play by Playcast, Todd Bodet. <laughs> Wait, the Motel 6 guy? We'll leave the light on for you. No, Joel Godet. Joe Godet. Joel. Joe. Joel? Joel, with an L. Okay. Here's your host, Joel Godet. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Jim Barber is our guest here on episode number 74 of Play by Playcast. Welcome back in, everybody. Thanks, as always, for clicking subscribe and or download and joining us once again here on a Friday morning. My name is Joel Godet, and this is Play by Playcast, the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster. Or it's the podcast for play-by-play broadcasters about play-by-play broadcasters hosted by a play-by-play broadcaster. You know, I I always mix up the order, and you you would figure seventy four episodes in, I would I would be able to get it like right, like it would just roll off my tongue, like Colt Cabana says, the studio apartment. But I still can't get it right. Uh, anyway, it's a podcast about play-by-play, and it's available on Twitter. You can find us at pxpcast. You can find me at Joel Godet, J O E L G O D E T T. You can email me. J-G-O-D-E-T-T at B-S-U dot E-D-U. As always, we would love to hear from you. And if you have time, please do leave a rating or a review if you enjoy this podcast. I know not all of you have done it because I know how many people listen to the podcast and I know how many ratings and reviews there are. So click some stars. If it's one, uh, okay, don't click one. But if it's three, that's cool. If it's four or five, that's awesome. Uh, We'll take anything. We'll take anything three or above. Three or above. And listen, if you're going to give it a rating below that, like, I, I don't know why you're still in here 74 episodes deep. Anyway, uh, let's get into let's get into Jim Barber, who uh, I've known for a while. Ever since I came to Ball State as the, the radio voice, Jim has been doing the vast majority of Ball State football games on ESPN3 and uh, does a bunch of national college basketball games throughout the Mid-American Conference once we get into to league play and, and you get the Friday night games. I, I believe he did the Kent State Buffalo game in Buffalo, New York that started at like 10 p.m. And it was a sellout um, just because it was a national TV game and it was a wacky time and they, they promoted the heck out of it. But it was an awesome broadcast to watch uh, a couple of years ago. Jim has taken an interesting path. He's been a full-time play-by-play guy at ESPN since 19... 19- 90, well, he's been a full-time guy since the early 2000s, but he's been with ESPN since 1995. And those full-time jobs, by the way, no easy pickings. So, I mean, Jim's in uh, with ESPN uh, overall since 1995. But before that, he really worked to carve his way in play-by-play. He was doing Purdue games. He was with uh, the Big Ten Network and Raycom. NCAA soccer championships. He had done some minor league baseball, some minor league hockey. uh, And he decided he was going to get into play-by-play in his 30s. He had been the local television sports anchor at Wish TV, Channel 8 in Indianapolis, where he still lives, and was let go. And in his early 30s, and he'll detail this, went out to California, went to a sports broadcasting camp way before you have the litany of camps that exist today and you know he's this older guy with some 18 and 19 year old guys uh trying this out and trying to to find his way in this business uh so he'll talk about that journey and it's and it's unique in and of itself and uh really makes you appreciative for how difficult this industry is and and to appreciate uh the spots that we are all in where we start this interview though is with his time as the sports anchor at wish tv because when he was at wish tv bob knight was the head men's basketball coach at indiana university and it was a different time in terms of how you covered college sports and probably just how you covered sports in general um when jim was at wish tv and you can find his some some anchoring clips of him by the way on youtube Uh, please do go look those up because his mustache is phenomenal uh, Jim Barber, B-A-R-B-A-R, um, on YouTube, Wish TV, Channel 8. Search it. But 
uh, there weren't like post game press conferences back then. You just you you went and you you did a lot of one on ones after games, etc. And there was a time where Jim was banned from Assembly Hall by Bob Knight. Like, persona non grata, picture on the front door, don't let him in. Like, Larry David can't get back into his country club on curb this past week. Banned. Um, So that's a cool story. But what makes it cooler is that Jim later did a game on ESPN with Bob Knight. We're going to talk about all of that and much more off the top here with Jim Barber of ESPN on Play by Play Cast. Long time ago, Joel, um, high school history teacher, knew I wanted to be in broadcasting, and he said, uh, let's take you down to a local radio station. Meet all the people that count. I wound up working for that sports director for four years. Slid over to public broadcasting for another four up in Lake County, Indiana, and did a lot of sports there. And then uh, did an, it was like an internship at CBS in Chicago for the summer, but I got paid, and paid nicely at that time. And as an assistant producer, they recommended that uh, Indianapolis be my next stop on the air. And even though it wasn't a position I was that good at, uh, I came down to Indianapolis, anchored 10. And after 10 years, when I was let go, I remember them asking me at Channel 8, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do, which is call games. And I went to a sportscaster's camp in Los Angeles a couple of years earlier, kind of test my, uh, my skills and, and fared pretty well. He actually threw me in the job uh, in the running for the UCLA radio position, which I think was a couple heads and shoulders above what I deserved. But it was very flattering, and I think at that time I knew this is what I wanted to continue doing, and that's probably what I always wanted to do when I was 16 or 17. What, what kind of boss lets you go and says, okay, what are you going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> I still remember the day when I got, got let go, and my contract was expiring, and everybody's head was down, so you knew it wasn't good when they called you in at Channel 8. But, um, you know, I think we had a pretty good friendship there, so I think they were concerned about what happens next. Uh, I think they thought I was going to go anchor in Chicago or something because I had an agent. But, um, frankly, my talent wasn't at that point where I could have worked there. And I really had an agent so I could get a good contract deal at Wish. That job became open after a guy named Ed Hardy went to Boston. And um, I was about the last guy they offered it to. So I wasn't too flattered about it. And frankly, I didn't want to anchor anyway. It's, there's a lot that goes into anchoring besides uh, the job itself, a lot of PR and everything. And that's not something I'm overly comfortable with. It wasn't at the time. So when I told them play-by-play, play, everybody just kind of breathed a sigh of relief. And I was making good money at Channel 8. My first game doing high school football was 100 bucks. I thought the 100 bucks was a bigger deal because I was getting to do what I always wanted to do this let's talk about some stories though at wish tv because i there is a clip on youtube of you giving a speech at a right state i I think basketball tip-off dinner or or luncheon way does it no it's i guess that's what they teach you nowadays um you got banned from assembly hall as a wish tv sports anchor how'd that happen uh the relationship with bob Knight at the time they didn't have um conferences after games it was all one-on-one. Oh, interesting. So imagine trying to get some of the biggest name in sports to comment. And uh, so would he have to do one-on-ones with everybody? How did like? At that time, it wasn't the media concentrate. Believe it or not, that it is now. There are basically three TV stations. Those are the three that sought access like that. So um, Knight picked and chose the people he liked, and I was new, and he picked on me, and I didn't like it. So I took some shots at him on the air. He didn't like that either. Uh, eventually, he allowed me back in Assembly Hall, but then we, uh, for lack of a better term, ambushed him when there was a story coming out that he was headed to Stanford. Uh, it was really a poor choice of, uh, uh, of work that night on our part, but, you know, we didn't like him. So, uh, anyway, he didn't go to Stanford, <laughs> and we never were allowed back in. But here, here's the, the most ironic part of it. Uh, just a few years ago before night was let go by ESPN, Got a call from our producer, Chris Farrow, and he said to stand by. We think we've got a late addition to your schedule. So it's very hush hush, which was really unusual. I mean, basically, you get a game, they call you, email you. No talent was listed on the game until the last minute. It was Bob Knight, and I thought, my gosh, you know, my career's done. <laughs> He's never going to forget what happened, but he couldn't have been nicer. And uh, you know, he had changed. 
Uh, the officials actually were smiling and coming over and talking to prior to the game. It was a Louisville-Western Kentucky game in Nashville at a neutral court uh, at the arena they used for hockey. And uh, they couldn't have been nicer. And I wound up uh, hearing all his stories at the end of the game. So I was there at about, I don't know, midnight or one and then drove back for, for mass the next day. But it was, uh, you know, it wasn't vindication, but at least uh, any type of uh, revenge wasn't on his mind. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I could still get back in Assembly Hall if he was coaching, but nonetheless, at least that went well. How'd that conversation go? When I, when did you first see each other or talk to each other? And I would imagine he remembered who Jim Barber was at, at the onset. I think to go along with that, it's a good point. Um, I think Knight was sought for approval of the announcer, which makes it more interesting because he was pretty powerful, even at the time at ESPN. So I think that's why there was the secrecy and the hesitation. Because otherwise, that had never happened before. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, you get an assignment, you go with it. But I think it was pending his approval. Or it's possible that they hadn't gotten an analyst until the last minute and it was going to be him. But um, when I first saw him in the elevator, uh, we didn't say anything to each other. And I wasn't mad at him, but I thought, what am I going to say to him? At practice, um, he went and talked to Rick Pitino that day. And he didn't come over and say hello. So that was all right. So I just basically was going to check out of my hotel that night and probably start looking into another career. <laughs> but about an hour before the game, he shows up, and I'm doing my notes, and he looks at me and he goes, who do you think is going to win tonight? I said, probably Louisville. And he sat down, and he chatted, and he couldn't have been more friendly. Rick Pitino came over prior to the game. He said, you know what? Um, you're going to have to do most of the work because your analyst is not going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but he had great stories, and, and he did a nice job. What was it like working with him that night? The thing is that um, I, th I think you have to win his respect, even though I didn't try, simply because I, I prepare just like you prepare. Maybe that won his respect more than anything, that you just showed up and <laughs> forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, um, because I really didn't think that uh, it was going to go well. You know, I still had memories of it. I mean, people still have it on tape when I got banned when he threw me out of a conference, press conference. I mean, I used to see that thing ad nauseum, people at parties. It's like, give it up, man. I mean, <laughs> But I understand. I suppose if I was on the other side, I'd be interested. But um, I thought it went well because his knowledge was off the chart. He actually diagrammed the winning play in 87. Keith Smart hit the jumper that you see on CBS every year around tournament time on a napkin, and he showed me what all five guys were doing. So I said something about, you know, it's the, the shot fake on the air. That, that seemed to have made your teams really good because Louisville was doing something like that. And he was kind of impressed by that. He said, well, we're, you know, speaking of shot fake. And so I, I thought it went really well. He was very complimentary afterwards. And, um, you know, I survived the night. In fact, our producer called me up on Christmas Eve, executive producer, and said, guys look like you were long-lost friends. I said, look, I just wanted to get through the, the night without any trouble. <laughs> we were long lost, but yeah, so, yeah, something like that. I was the one who was lost. I mean, he was so powerful back then that he could ban you from, um, from an arena like he did it myself and the photographer that did the ambush. And the TV station went right along with it because they wanted access. But now with conferences, groups of people in for interviews, it's much easier. I mean, coaches still get testy reporters, with reporters, but back then it was one on one, and that was that was a challenge. And uh, I didn't look forward to it, but I got through it. What's different about that? And maybe this is more like a general media landscape question, but you know, nowadays you can go to a press conference and hide pretty easily. Uh, back then, I, for lack of a better term, like you've got to man up to whatever the relationship is, and if you say something that he doesn't like, or if he does something that that you've got to question hard. Uh, you've got to do it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and I guess in some respects that gets lost nowadays because you can go to a press conference and never ask a question and cover a team and not even live there, for, I mean, sure. for, for being honest. Uh, what was different about it back then, and how did that maybe make you better then and now? Well, I think you had to be more courageous. I think you had to take that step because if you didn't come back with an interview and his team had won, then you're going to face a lot of scrutiny from your bosses. Back then when you're fighting for ratings, getting a Bob Knight interview was the world. Um, and I do remember the first interview I did with him where he basically embarrassed me. My last question was to him that, uh, hey, Isaiah had, Isaiah Thomas had a great night shooting free throws where he had struggled in the prior. Uh, why was that? And he said, well, um, we had him pray to the God that he worships prior to the game 
and his prayers were answered. So I, I just think you developed more courage. You knew you had to get the story. You rooted like heck that they wouldn't win, so you wouldn't have to bother with him. But uh, you also knew that this was the territory, and uh, one-on-ones back then were a lot more common than the press conferences now. Do you ever watch your tapes back of being a sports anchor and remember back to it? I have buddies of mine that still sent it to me. My nephew has a tape. He was going over some things in Phoenix about two weeks ago <laughs> and sent me an old Wish TV Channel 8 tape. And you know what? I'm just as critical of my work back then as I am now. If I like it, I'll watch it. If I remember it and it didn't look good or I looked uncomfortable, then it was like, you know, thanks for sending it along and I'll keep it. But uh, there was the, the day that um, LMU Loyola Marymount lost Hank Gathers, who collapsed on the floor and died of a game, conference game, a tournament game. Uh, and I still have a tape that my friends showed me where I anchored uh, in the studio as a second person reporter because I'd been to the uh, sportscasters camp where Gathers was at. Wow. About six months prior, so I was able to speak a little bit as to you know what Hank was like and how well he was respected by everybody. So um, yeah, I, I still see some of the tapes. I'll show it to my wife and daughter. They think it's hilarious. It's like Stone Age stuff, man. <laughs> but you know what? It's what made me what I am today, and been able to stay 25 years with ESPN, even at their uh, you know internet level at this point, which I think is still pretty flattering because. They have a lot of great talent there. Uh, how I've known you for six years. You've looked like you look now for six years. Uh, how long after working on television in Indianapolis did you keep the mustache? Uh, I shaved it off the day uh, that officially I was let go. Did you really? Yeah, or the next day. Was that like the clean st- – did they – I don't – maybe, they, you know, I know they're really conscious about that stuff in television all the time. Like, did they tell you to have a mustache and it'll make you look older or like – No, not at all. I, I liked it because I thought the girls liked it. And I dated a girl that liked it, even though she probably liked other guys more than me. <laughs> and I kept it on until the last day. They had a party for me going away on an early October night in 1990 after we finished with our assignments. And then the next day, I was trying to remember, I flew to Southern California to be with my best friend. And uh, I went into the, uh, the washroom, and I had my razor, and I, I walked out without it, and I haven't had it on since. And my, my daughter thinks it's pretty cool. She... Asks me occasionally if I'm going to grow one back, but uh, I like it right where I'm at. Fair enough. It's just the first, it pulled up, and I went, "That's not. Oh my God, that's Jim. <laughs> that's the same guy." I had the same reaction, Joel. <laughs> and then you started talking. I was like, "Wow, okay, it's he it sounds exactly the same mm-hmm. even back then." Uh, sportscasters camp. Um, those those have become very popular nowadays. Yes. Uh, for I mean, all the way down to kids. Um, but back then, what was it? How did you find it? And and what did you think going there? Roy Engelbrecht ran it in Southern California on the campus of Loyola Marymount. And um, I think I found it just by word of mouth, perhaps. It's been so long, I don't even remember. But when I applied, uh, it was about $1,000 for the week. And you spent several days out there. And you had some of the biggest names at that time in television and radio there. Bob Costas spoke. Joel Myers, who's with ESPN3 now, was one of the talent working in Los Angeles. Bob Miller, who just retired as a longtime Kings hockey announcer, was actually my counselor and the one who put me in contact with UCLA when uh, when I finished the six days. So I think it might have been word of mouth. And once I got there, I mean, the campus is gorgeous. I mean, it, it just almost sits on the ocean out there. And you stayed in dorms, and you went through all the procedures necessary for them to evaluate your talent, including calling a live baseball game at uh, the Big A in Anaheim, which I really enjoyed. And uh, I kind of was older, so I think I stood above everybody else because I had broadcasting experience. A lot of the other guys were 17, 18, 19, which at that time I wish I was. But, you know, just getting used to a microphone was a big deal for them. So I was pretty polished. And um, I think that, you know, if you're looking for a career – in broadcasting, those are good things to go to because it doesn't necessarily mean employment, but it gives you ideas outside of job openings, how to market yourself, syndicate yourself, so that maybe you find a college, a small college, and not doing any radio or even TV now with E3 involved, and maybe get your foot in the door by creating some opportunities as opposed to applying for some. How old were you when you went? It would have been 88, so I would have been mid-30s. So what are you thinking at that point when 
you're going to, not a total career change, but certainly a different path in broadcasting. I'm going to go to this camp with 17, 18, 19-year-olds. I've got to make a living. I, you know, you're basically making, you're taking a leap of faith and going on a divergent path. Uh, how hard was that to do, and how did you do it? It's a great question. Um, I suppose I've been flirting with it ever since I got to Wish. I always thought the people at Wish were terrific, but I always felt like I was about two or three plays behind when I anchored. And I think it took me seven or eight years before I really got comfortable, where I could actually smile on the air, knew how to go to, from tape to tape, maybe less than that. But um, I thought that if anything ever developed where I could go into play-by-play -play and still afford it, still make it work, that I would do it. And when I first started in cable in 1990 at $100 a game for X amount of games, there are many years from then on where I had to do other jobs, sales jobs, uh, technical jobs where I was grading school papers, uh, telemarketing things. And it wasn't probably until early 2000 or so, maybe mid-2000, where it became a full-time career without any other employment needed. Now I'm under the full-time guise of Disney, and I sign a contract, and that's for X amount of games per year. But for that period of time, prior to that, up until 2005 or so, I had to find other employment just to uh, make things make uh, make things uh, meet. What's the best telemarketing call you ever had? <laughs> I never lasted very long at those jobs, Joel. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, the best job I ever had in sales was a memory training job. You had to travel and set up in a city like Fort Wayne or Nashville, but you did it through the Chamber of Commerces. And so basically you could make your phone call saying, you know, I'm representing the Chamber of Commerce. I have a new exciting product to show you. And um, it would only take nine minutes of your time. And before you even got a reaction, you'd say, what are you doing at 2 o'clock on Wednesday? It was very positive, forward-type training. And the beauty of it was that you had a script. You already had it memorized. And at the end, you just laid out to see what they were going to do. They call it silent close. The first day, I botched the script up so badly in my mind, I thought, well, I'll just get up and get out of here. The accountants looked at me and said, this must be a pretty easy job because we're going we're gonna to do this. It was like $1,100. You got the check on the spot or basically you didn't get the sale. So that telemarketing call to set up appointments and then follow up with a visit was probably the best job. What else did you do? Because you're certified, uh, your ESPN bio, and this is bad on me because I read it sure. like an hour ago, but you're certified in what? Counseling. That's right. You can do gambling, drug, and alcohol, but more certified in gambling. Uh, during some of my downtime, I uh, met some friends, and they were working at a treatment center. So I went over there to um, shake hands and kiss babies, and they were looking for counselors. So I got a chance to work two or three years with people who are struggling with gambling. And then two years later, I did some drug and alcohol. So I'm certified nationally in gambling treatment because it requires 3,000 hours of actual work experience, which I have. The drug and alcohol, I'm, I really don't have that much experience at, but working with people who struggled with those addictions, that's pretty special. And when you can uh, offer some advice from the outside, particularly people who are struggling with any addiction, struggling with any addiction, uh, it makes it all worthwhile, and I think if I ever had a chance to go back and do some counseling, I would do it again. The way that it's all played out, I mean, are you almost, everybody wants to get into this and do it full-time gung-ho from day one. Sure. Are you most thankful it worked out the way it did and you had those experiences? I do, because um, I think that as as talent grows at ESPN, and they've got their pick, I mean, you're doing some work for them. A lot of people across the country are doing work for them. Uh, they know where the talent lies, and uh, my joke is they're not only younger than I am, they're all good-looking, which really bothers me. <laughs> but um, I think it's worked out for the better because you had to fight just to stay alive, so to speak. And I think I have a different perspective. It's not all or anything, all or nothing. Uh, whenever I'm called up to do a big game at ESPN, which is rare, but it still happens, uh, you're very thankful for it as opposed to being bitter about the chance I didn't get. I've had chances with them. And uh, either you climb that mountain and stay or you don't. And that's certainly their, their opinion. And it doesn't make me work any harder or any less um, hard on this level. Um, it's still very important. This doing Ball State is important to me. Um, so, yeah, I think it's worked out nicely because I've had to struggle a bit. And at the same time, I think it kept a balance or a perspective 
that if it didn't work out that I could climb to an ESPN National Game of the Week, that's fine because E3 has opened up great opportunities for a lot of us who likely would be out of broadcasting at this point. Let's talk about the climb from the beginning at the network, though, because 1995 you join ESPN, and at that point they're still a fairly young company. Um, how do you wind up there? How do you climb the ranks once you're there at that point in time? Uh, kind of take me on the early stages of your, your journey at the Four Letter Network. Just prior to that, uh, when I was doing memory training, I came home on a weekend, as I like to believe uh, my faith would have it, and I was reading the local sports columnist, critic, and uh, Ken Double, who was doing Purdue basketball at the time, was leaving. And so that meant a job at Raycom doing Purdue TV was open. And so I applied, and it came down between me and Mike Goldberg, who has done UFC with Fox and hockey and some football. And um, because I had a relationship with Gene Cady, who I actually interviewed with, and when I did the interview, he did all the talking. He just kind of listened. And uh, because of that relationship, I got the job. So when Raycom gave up Big Ten in 95 and ESPN came in, all I had to do was sit down with the Big Ten officials, executives. Jim Delaney was in the meeting, Mark Rudner. Uh, they're still very much there. And uh, explain why it was important for me to be part of the Big Ten. I got grandfathered in. And then ESPN took the two announcer per game TV setup uh, where you'd have two for one team, two for the other, and reduce that to uh, a general pool of announcers. And then away we went. Um, with Raycom, I worked three years. I got to do some of their national games, which was a lot of fun. And uh, because of that experience, it allowed me to get into ESPN Regional. ESPN Plus, it was called at the time. We did a Big Ten game of the week. Myself, Wayne Larvey, who was with the Packers. Randy Wright, who played at Wisconsin and Green Bay. And we were like the third-tier game, probably what the U is doing now or has done. But we had uh, sideline passes, access for every Saturday game that started at noon Eastern, 11 Central. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I was let go in seven or eight years later when they kind of did away with the sideline person for a while. But uh, it was a great experience. And I think because the company was so young and looking more at their production abilities than talent, we were able to go along for a ride for a while before any extreme critiques were applied. Now, that's a little different right now. It's a question we haven't asked on the podcast in a while, so um, I, I want to dive into it a little bit. What's the, what's the critique like at ESPN? How do you know you're doing a good job? Who tells you, uh, or who do you ask? Like, hey, can you watch this for me? Or, hey, what did you think? Or is that more an individual production basis of the people that you're working with on a daily basis? It's a great question, and it's funny you should ask, because... Um, Hudson Mason, who was here Saturday working with me, is now a rookie with ESPN after quarterbacking at Georgia. And uh, he's going through that in his life. He's wanting to know, am I doing a good job? When he kind of pushed the bosses to give a critique, it wasn't, in his mind, favorable. But I talked to him on a Sunday saying, you know, if they're paying attention to you, that's a good thing. Because it means they've got some value in you, you've got some value, and you've got a future with them. So... We took some of the critiques that they offered or suggestions in their critique and said, let's, let's see how I can help you. Let's see what you can do. And I, I thought his work on Saturday was pretty good, particularly compared to the first week. So I think a lot of the guys who come in now are really concerned about getting feedback every week. To me, the feedback is positive if there's nothing said and if you're still getting hired. And besides, they're the kind of people that if they have a problem, it only takes them about five seconds to let you know. I have my phone right next to me, Joel, every game, email, uh, text, because I would rather hear, and I have heard, I've been on broadcasts where the producer, executive producer, will call up and say, tell Jim to shut up. He's talking too much. I want to hear the crowd. It's brutal. But you know what? They're the bosses, and they know best, and at the same time, I'd rather hear it then then read about it later. And I think when you work for that network where perfection, perfection is expected, uh, you try to rise to that occasion and anything less than that, they may call you on or maybe that's your own expectations that are pretty high. But uh, you're never unprepared for a game. I mean, you have access to anything the ESPN national people have access to. And for that, you feel privileged. What do you have access to? Just about every type of uh, statistical source 
that they have. They'll do printouts on games, college football. Uh, they will do printouts every day when we get into basketball on the key games. Usually it's a top 25. But, I mean, their statistics are 7, 8, 9, 10 pages long. I mean, you'll get a litany of stuff if Louisville's playing Duke in basketball that going back to the first game ever played between the two, a lot of it is unusual, unusable in the sense that it's not a game that applies to you. But it's good background stuff, and you really feel a part of it so that if you have a game, even if you're in the MAC that night, but you're showing a score of Louisville, that you can relate that information and feel up to speed and knowledgeable because they're research people who make it so. I was going to say, at that level where there's so much, how do you discern uh, what you want to know, what you need to know, and what you're going to use? Yeah, the, the great laugh I have with our bosses is that they keep throwing things on your plate, and then at the end they'll go, now, don't forget to breathe and have fun. <laughs> you're trying to cram all this stuff in. Um, I, I think it's the old Al Michaels theory, and you probably find this when you do games. If you use 10 or 15% of your stuff, besides the basics, then it's a good night. And if you leave a lot on the plate, sometimes I feel bad about it. But at the same time, if I've got Ball State coming up in a couple of weeks, I'll pass that along to the next game notes uh, in my flip cards. Um, I think that uh, with their research ability, the things they pass along, it's very difficult not to feel ready for something. But in terms of discerning, that's the challenge because particularly in basketball, just so much information and it's a circuit overload and you don't want to be reading as you're on the air and you don't want to be talking sometimes when the moment is allowing for some some silence this is a question i've never had bef- i've always had i've never asked on the podcast and i just thinking with the it's amount of first today well right the, the amount of ball state games that you've done with us it kind of just triggered it in my head because and you having done Purdue the way that you did it um, on a you know quote unquote network, but you're always doing the Purdue game. Um, when we do Ball State games and it's basketball, and we produce them for ESPN three. Um, we oftentimes have the thought or the question: well, we have we we addressed this story six games ago. Do we bring it back up now, or you know how many times do we say Sean Sellers is X Y Z and you know Trey Moses is X Y Z because you know we're we're doing the same game. We've we've seen the same people and. We have to imagine at some level, some of the same people are watching. When you're hired out by ESPN to do three or four Ball State games a season, how many times will you rehash something about a guy? Obviously, you're speaking to a different audience, but in your head, you know, we've already covered this. We've already done this. Um, How do you strike that right balance? This may surprise you. Sometimes we'll mention it twice in a game. And the theory being is that your first half audience can vary from your second half audience. So it's not insulting to bring it back. Maybe you spin it a little differently. We're introducing Anthony Winbush in a a lot of our games at Ball State. And, you know, as he adds to his sack total, we try to find different stories to go with it. But when we get opposing coaches' reactions, you know, this guy's a monster, he's scary, a lot of times that's a fresh coat of paint. But if we're addressing that in the first half of a game and he continues to eat the offense on the other side alive, it's worth bringing the quote back. So um, I just assume the audiences are always different. And you're also, in the case of when you're doing the Mac, the action during the week, you have a lot of Mac coaches and players watching. So I just automatically assume that it's, it's a different breed of cat. And um, particularly if it's a good story I've used before, why not keep it alive? Sometimes we tell the same jokes before. If I have different analysts, it works nicely. I don't think you can ever assume that uh, it's old material, even if your challenge is a little differently because you're going to do 30-some-odd basketball games. But um, but I guess when you were doing so many Purdue games, mm-hmm. how did you approach something like that in, in, in the same way? Well, one thing that helped is we went to practice a lot, so we got a lot of new stuff. I mean, it was Gene Cady, so it was never a dull moment with him. But um, I tried to use things that um, I still thought were pertinent. I mean, stats change, so that's a little easier. Um, I also tried to be as objective as I could, which sometimes rubbed the Purdue audience wrong. But I was okay with that because I thought at that time I'm working for Raycom and then ESPN. Um, And I don't think you can kid a basketball audience. I mean, the team is bad. I remember one time I went to a break at halftime. 
It's like 22-17 or something. And I said something like, this first half mercifully comes to an end. And after I said it, I thought, well, you know, these are kids. It wasn't very nice. But the half did mercifully come to an end. <laughs> it wasn't good basketball. And I was okay with it. Um, so I, I, I think it's okay to continue to repeat stories. Um, I know you work pretty hard at your job, and so do I. So you never have to worry about relying on it with no other material. If it's a good story, it's worth bringing back. How much do you watch yourself back, even today? Uh, and if you were to do it today, what are you watching for? I watch myself a lot more now, and it's usually the last thing I do before a game. Late last night I was watching Ball State and Central Michigan. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where I think the announcer said, or maybe he said in his dot-com hit afterwards, that Ball State had as many points as Central Michigan had field goal or touchdowns. Pretty close anyway, 9-8. to eight. Um, The things I look for is how am I relating to the analyst? If I'm bringing humor, am I getting a little bit too carried away? Am I letting the broadcast breathe a little bit? Uh, am I identifying players as quickly as I should, which I think is always a, a concern, particularly on special teams? We don't always have spotters, so that's a challenge. Um, am I overloading with statistics? Um, am I looking good on camera? Do I look comfortable? Am I cliche-ish? I try to avoid that. Uh, I look for a lot of things, and I can actually watch my tape now a lot longer than I used to. But it doesn't help to shut the tape off after a couple of minutes if you're mad about something that you should have said because there's still two and a half hours to go. So I, I try to be as objective, and I'm probably pretty critical. But it only helps for the next game because I know when I work the next contest with somebody, it's not likely I'll repeat, repeat what I thought was the same mistake. How much um, silence is the right silence for you? Uh, when you're watching something, like, where's your trigger point? Like, right, Jim, shut up, or Jim, start talking again. And how does that vary on a day like Saturday when there were 20,000 people here versus a night like tonight? We're doing this on a midweek when, historically speaking, midweek games just don't draw the same way, and it will be quieter in the arena. Um, how does that change, how you strike that balance? Well, if the home team scores, and I know that's a rarity uh, prior to this uh, this game. Come on now. <laughs> um, the first thing we do is we lay out, and we'll lay out for a while until replay comes in. And when replay comes in, so does the analyst. And when I was working with Hudson Mason over the weekend, I said when the Cardinals score against Central Michigan, when they score a touchdown, <laughs> probably thought afterwards, what was Jim speaking about? <laughs> um, but even after, you know, Hagee hit his field goals, uh, you just lay out for a little bit. And I think the right balance on that is that if you've got a rocking crowd, you let the producer and director take you for a while. Uh, basketball in particular, we can do that. Uh, I've laid out sometimes for half a minute if the place is electric. I've even gone a commercial break not saying anything. And then in my headset, I'll hit my talk back and say, you know, they say silence is golden. I couldn't think of anything brilliant to say. But in football, replays come pretty quickly. So I'd say probably between 5 and 10 seconds. I try to lay out now before the snap uh, because we've been asked to, and I think that's smart. So I'll watch a lot of the really good national guys do that. And I think it's um, it's easier to watch then. I remember watching one of my tapes going, gosh, I'm talking over everything. Shut up now, you know. And the analysts, when I work with young guys, they're always talking. And they know they've got to bring it down. I work with a veteran like Mark Herman, no problem. He knows when to get out of a play. And I don't mind when a game, Joel, is a blowout. I mean, if you're talking over snaps, who cares? But if the game is close, it's tight, it's fun, it's exciting. Um, before the snap, I try to lay out. After scores, I try to lay out, particularly with the home team. And, um, you know, sometimes our pictures are so good that we'll just let the audience enjoy them and uh, let that go. How do you break in a new analyst, or a, m new to you and new to new to the industry as well? And I guess those are two different questions, but sometimes they intersect. Um, what's what's your protocol for establishing a rapport? I do know, I do very little. Um, if they ask me for suggestions, I'll offer them, but I let them breathe. I let them go. Um, I think they've got enough on their mind initially, and I'm trying to. I take some pride, I guess. Maybe that's the wrong word. But I, I enjoy 
trying to see how I can adjust. If somebody's going to do a lot of talking, then I've got to pick some better spots. Or maybe uh, when I lead into him, uh, I find a different way so that maybe he can curtail some of his talking. With uh, Hudson, for example, uh, we went over after he got his critique from our bosses, the idea of delivering a sentence but not adding the word but or and. Delivering a sen sentence, drop your inflection, period. That's it. Get out. And, you know, I think he picked up nicely from week one to whatever the week was when he worked with me recently. And it wasn't so much my advice. The fact is the bosses were watching, and I think they gave him some perspective on how to make that easier. But um, with new guys, I, I let them find their own way. And then if they're interested afterwards, then I'll sit with them or I'll, I'll send some. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll send the ABCs that ESPN sends me. And they've got, you know, a list from A to Z. And they send them out every year. And so I'll send that to them so it doesn't look like I'm critiquing them. So they can look that, take that to heart. Uh, my best story is Adam Amin, who's terrific. And I've told it too many times, but was calling upon me when he was at Valpo for some perspective on his work. And I thought it was really good. He was going to be a star. But I also thought there were parts of it that he could be better at. So I offered that. And he said, hey, great, fine, thank you. You know, two years later, he's got an agent. Now he's doing uh, NFL football on the weekends. And I still tease him about it because he's such a nice person. I said, uh, boy, you know, despite my advice, look where you've landed. <laughs> but I was flattered he called upon me. And uh, I really try when people send me work to be as flattering as I can, but at the same time also be as honest as I can. And so when I work with new guys, um, I'll let them find their own way. And then if they want to know more, glad to help out. Last question, I'll let you go because we both have a game to go call. Um, but I know you've called a lot of things as well. Uh, what's the best thing you've called, the hardest thing you've called? I guess you can kind of take this in any direction you want, but I know you've done Little League World Series, which is unique challenges because you're dealing with kids. Uh, so that's one. There's not a ton of information. You've got to dig it all up yourself, all, all of that. Uh, I know you've done Ultimate, which I would not have the slightest idea um, Most of the critics thought the same thing of me. <laughs> <laughs> like one of the, the critiques is still on, uh, you dial my name up, um, and we're trying to be kind. I eventually got a hold of critics saying, hey, you know, you're right. But my bosses at ESPN thought the work was good, so I retired undefeated as far as I'm concerned. And Lepler's like muttering under his breath because he's like, I just yeah, want to do it. And, you know, <laughs> Evan's very good at that. That's his thing. He also does college basketball and football, so we had a pretty good laugh afterwards, but <laughs> I felt a little overmatched. I tried really hard. I came in three days earlier, I watched matches, I tried to get the lingo down, but I think Mike Cousins actually did a game or a weekend, and even he got criticized, and Mike's pretty good. So, you know, I, I took that in perspective, thinking that the, uh, you know, the ultimate audience is tough. <laughs> so I would say that, and also calling lacrosse. I, I spent a whole weekend getting ready for that, too, and that was women's lacrosse division, too. I've never seen so many fouls in a match and injuries. It's, it's, a, it's a tough sport. Uh, those were the two toughest. Best I ever called was the um, Big Ten. Actually, it wasn't Big Ten. It was NCAA Regional Championship in Indiana a few years ago in baseball. Kyle Schwarber's last game, beaten on a walk-off by a shortstop. And I remember my voice afterwards rising, maybe not to the level of like Sean McDonough or something, but I was shocked because it was the shortstop who had one home run prior to that. They were down one, Stanford, bottom of night. They were the home team in the final game at Indiana. And uh, they beat him on a home run to right field. And uh, Schwarber said it, it took him months to get over it, and I could see why. That was probably the best game I ever called. Well, Jim, uh, hopefully we can rival that here tonight. Uh, <laughs> appreciate, or not. <laughs> or not. Uh, appreciate the time. It's been fun uh, to sit down and, and pick your brain a little bit and uh, hear about being banned from Assembly Hall. May it never happen to me. <laughs> it's a real pleasure, Joel, and it's nice to talk with you on the record now as opposed to off the record. Fair enough. Jim, thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. Jim Barber joining us here on Play by Playcast. Unfortunately, by the way, for those of you curious, uh, the final score of the game that we were preparing to broadcast was 58 to 17 ball state and toledo at schumann stadium in muncie indiana a couple of weeks ago it was a good game for a while it was seven to three after the first quarter and it was pretty good into the second quarter as well but toledo is a really good team it's only lost this year as i record this 
uh, was was to Miami of Florida, who, as I record this, is undefeated. So, yeah, yeah they're pretty good. They're kind of like this year's Western Michigan, except that they have a loss, so they're probably not going to the Cotton Bowl. And uh, and Ball State has started, not started, but has played 26 freshmen, true or redshirt, which is most in FBS football. So it was an interesting matchup. Uh, the Cardinals will get there, but it's it's going to take some time. Um. So that was that was immediately what followed this episode of, of the podcast. But uh, fun one. I hope you guys took a lot out of that conversation. And again, I, I think it speaks a lot to the appreciation we can all have for uh, where we are in this business and in this industry. And and I mean, you listen to to how much Jim wanted it and what he did to get to the place that he's at. Uh, all the different jobs that he had and, and working in telemarketing, basically telesales. And, uh, you know, and, and the gambling counseling, uh, which makes you get, kind of gives you a different insight into life, most certainly, um, and, and makes you better as a person. And, and I think in some ways, probably there were there were certain things that he pulled from that to make him a better broadcaster, like any experience you have in life. Um, but uh, really cool path, interesting path, unique path. And that's, uh, you know, that's been the case 74 times here on the podcast. So I was glad. Uh, all the times I run into Jim and all the all the conversations I've had with Jim, finally happy that we were able to sit down, uh, hit record, and, and have one of those conversations here uh, with and for all of you guys as well. And by the way, the Bob Knight stuff is classic. Just classic. If I can, we'll wrap it up on this note. I'll give you a Bob Knight anecdote for myself. Um, when I was in college... Bob Knight was broadcasting for ESPN at one of those preseason tournaments, and he didn't have a Syracuse game. He had the game before us. I think it was Syracuse, Kansas, and then Florida was playing Washington. It was the game before us. Bob Knight had Florida, Washington. And we wanted to get Bob Knight on the pregame show for the student radio station, so I went down. We're in the Sprint Center in Kansas City. I went down to the, uh, like the, the, the spot where you walk off the court, waiting for Bob Knight to come off. And greeted him said hey bob knight joel Gadat, wair radio you know syracuse we'd love to do a interview with you if you have a couple of minutes for our pregame show and he said no but here's the great part the entrance or the exit that i caught him at was a dead end on one side you couldn't turn left you could only turn right so at that point bob knight turns right to go back to the green room and I turned right to go back to the elevator, neither of which was within like a hundred yards of where we had first interacted. So for the next like 70 yards, we're walking side by side. There's nobody else around. It's just he and I. And he looks at me final 30 yards and goes, all right, let's just do this. Walked in, sat down in the green room. At that point, Dick Vitale and Dan Schumann are watching the interview. Uh, no pressure. And uh, I asked I asked Bobby Knight about Paul Harris. If you remember, Paul Harris was a uh, six foot four, tremendous rebounder at Syracuse. Great dunker. Once dunked over me uh, at the wreck. True story. Another time. Um, but I asked him about Paul Harris, and Bob Knight's response was, "You media types are all the same." And then he went into a whole bunch of other stuff. But uh, that was, I've been called a media type by Bob Knight. Not quite getting banned from the arena. So point to Jim Barber. But that's my, uh, my, my Bob Knight anecdote for you. And on that note, we will wrap up this episode of Play by Play Cast. Uh, many thanks as always to Jim Barber. Uh, we always say if you enjoy the podcast, interact with them on Twitter. He's not super active. I don't think he's tweeted in like, two years. But uh, it's JV Barbar, JV Barber. Uh, J-V-B-A-R-B-A-R on Twitter if you want to let Jim know that you caught the episode and enjoyed it, please do and uh, please let others know if you catch uh, this episode on Twitter, retweet it or, or quote tweet it or whatnot and uh, help spread the word about PXP Cast. episode number 75 is next week I don't know what they call that in the Hunger Games but I know 75 was a special one so we'll see if we can't get a special guest for you, uh, in the meantime hit it Marshmallow it's Play by Play Cast and we're out and that will do it from St. Louis, where the score is inconclusive.